Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for a featured reading by Vermont Studio Center's virtual visiting writer, Belle Boggs. I'm Sarah Odsley. I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator, um, which is a long title and it just means that I help, I'm um, helping VSC um, with virtual programming and uh, writing specific stuff. Um, this event is sponsored by the Rana Jaffe Foundation, which, which supports women writers at critical times in their writing life through grants, fellowships, and awards. And we continue to be grateful for that partnership. Um, a little housekeeping. Make sure your audio is turned off and on mute. And once the re reading begins, I will switch the screen to speaker view and um, Bell should appear full, fully formed in your screen. Um, and I do wanna let you know that this reading is being recorded for archival purposes. So um, what that means is that VSC may choose to reshare publicly this um, recording. So if you do not want your visual image recorded, um, but want to stay in attendance, um, please turn off your video feature. And um, we will use the chat feature for a Q&A session afterwards. Um, and if you do wanna speak in your, you, you also are giving us the right to use your image and your voice. Um, um, tonight, Belle will read in two sections. Um, she'll read a section from her, her novel, The Gulf, and then um, a section of new work. Um, there'll be a little bit of break in between the first and the second section, and there'll be options, opportunities for questions. Now for the official bio. Belle Boggs is the author of The Gulf, a novel, The Art of Waiting, and Mattaponai Queen stories. I had to look up how to pronounce that word. I did it right, right? Yeah, you did. That's a, that was awesome. The Art of Waiting was a finalist for the Penn Diamondstein Spiegel Vogel Award for the Art of the Essay and was named a Best of the Book, Best Book of the Year by Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, The Globe and Mail, BuzzFeed, and O, Oprah's Magazine. Mattapanai Queen, a collection of linked Stories set along Virginia's Mattapanai River won the Bakeless Prize and the Library of Virginia Literary Award and was a finalist for the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. She has received fellowships from the New England, from the National Endowment for the Arts, the North Carolina Arts Council, and the Breadloaf and Suwannee Writers Conferences. Her stories and essays have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Monthly, Orion, the Paris Review, Harper's, Ecotone, Plowshares, and elsewhere. And she is an associate professor of English at North Carolina State University, where she also directs the MFA program in creative writing. Thanks so much for being here with us, Bell. Thank you for joining us, everyone in attendance. All right, Belle, take it away. Thank you, Sarah, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you so much to the Vermont Studio Center. I was um, really looking forward to being there in person, but I'm happy that I can be with you in this way. I'm gonna give a talk also tomorrow morning on um, humor and life's dreadful moments. So if you'd like to join us, that'll be at 10. And um, I'm gonna read from two things, as Sarah said, I'm gonna read from my novel, The Gulf, um, that came out last year, um, just a short section, and then you can ask questions if you like. And then I thought it would be nice to read something um, that's um, sort of in progress because um, that's what Vermont Studio Center does. You, the, the Vermont Studio Center makes space for artists and writers to work on work in progress, to work on new work. And I appreciate that so much. I have friends who've gotten um, such uh, wonderful help in their um, work and careers 
from Vermont Studio Center. So I appreciate um, all of you um, supporting the center um, in any way that you can. And, um, and I'll read from the Gulf. So I guess I should tell you that the Gulf is a novel about the creation of the first low residency writing program for evangelical Christians um, started by two exes um, in an old beach motel on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And um, I wrote this book, I started it, it's, it's set in 2011, and I started it in 2011. <laughs> um, it was published last year, and um, I was very interested in writing it in the intersection of um, art and capitalism and Christianity and politics. And um, I also wanted to write, um, as I, I think of myself as a short story writer slash essayist, I like, um, you know, kind of moving from point of view to point of view. So there are four point of view characters in the book. Um, and I'm going to re read from the two central um, point of view characters. Um, one is a um, an aspiring poet who is joining um, the ranch, um, uh, the Genesis Inspirational Writing Ranch, and um, and the other Marianne, who's one of the, who's also a poet, um, who's a founder of um, of the ranch. Uh, all right, I think that's all you need to know. This is pretty early in the novel. Across the Gulf, Janine Gray unlocked the file cabinet where she stored 10 years of lessons on nutrition, setting up a bank account, planning a budget, and checked the folder where she'd collected her photocopied submission materials. She reviewed the order of poems, the personal statement, even her own address neatly hand lettered on the information page, which she'd also photocopied. Janine did not often apply for things, not credit cards, she did not believe in them, not mortgage applications, her husband filled out the paperwork, and certainly not creative writing programs. How long would she have to wait before she heard something back? She had no idea. It was an extraordinarily personal and uncharacteristic thing she'd done, writing the statement and sending the poems. If they, whoever they were, did not like her poems, would they write to her anyway? Would they respond to the something Janine had tried to say with the poems? She wished for a cup of coffee and a cigarette, an early afternoon break routine she'd established when the girls were little, before she'd started teaching. But she didn't smoke anymore, and hardly any of the other teachers at the high school did either. The ones who couldn't quit had to walk all the way to the teacher's parking lot to sit in their cars. And while Janine occasionally felt like joining them, say someone set a fire in the kitchen, or she suspected a student may have called her a bad name in his native language, she resisted. How would it look for the life skills teacher to demonstrate such a nasty addiction? Life skills. When Janine was in high school, they'd called it home economics. The curriculum had hardly changed. Some sewing, some cooking, really the preparation of prepackaged convenience foods, and a little math. But home ec, the principal said, had a girly and old-fashioned ring to it, and the students were no longer the same perky future housewives who'd been Janine's classmates. No, Janine's students were bored, gum-snapping girls, delinquent boys who needed one more class to graduate, 10th graders who could not read or pronounce the word ingredients. These were students bound for work in fast food restaurants and big box stores, some of them bound for deportation. And every year, more of them, 28 in a classroom meant to hold 22, 30 sometimes. Janine knew the word whore in several languages and kept a stack of detention slips signed and filled out on her desk. Gross disrespect she'd written under reason on every one. One day, last fall, the principal came to speak to her about the frequency of her detention referrals. Didn't she think it would be better to work on her relationship with the students? He was a reasonable, maddeningly patient man who had taught for exactly one year. You mean, Janine said, I should let them? Not let them, the principal said. Work with them. That was when Janine started writing the poems. At first, she'd simply flipped the detention slips over and started writing. Sometimes she used the smooth green, oh, I'm sorry. Someone used the smooth green jersey intended for frog-shaped pillows to make a pot leaf. She wrote a poem. Someone used the hot dogs meant to be baked into pigs in blankets for lewd gestures. Poem. 
Someone cast talked over her lessons, texted or passed notes, poem. The students had thought she was writing detention slips and they would wait for her to hand them over so they could suck their teeth and roll their eyes at her. But she merely stuffed the slips into her top dress desk drawer and continued with the lesson. This is how to remove a seam. This is how to season a pan. This is how to extinguish a grease fire. What you doing with them slips, Miss Gray? Asked a boy who'd spent most of life skills one in detention. He had passed. That seemed to be the point of life skills. Everyone passed and was back for more as two of the classes made one math, math credit. He eyed her desk nervously. You saving him up or something? Janine had shrugged. Just writing something to myself, she said. He held out his hand. If I'm gonna have detention, I'll take it now, he said. But I haven't given you detention, Janine said. I was only writing. Not because of me? I didn't say that, Janine said. They went back and forth for a while. None of the students was able to confirm that Janine was hoarding a trove of detentions to be formed in the dis distant future into a mega detention. And there was significant argument about that, about that strategy's feasibility, but they were also not able to dispel the worry. One day's detention served on the spot, that was one thing that was survivable, but facing a desk drawer crammed with them, that was another thing entirely. And for Janine, the poems helped. At first, they were about the students themselves and their strange, unknowable, ridiculous choices. Why would someone choose to ruin perfectly good food? Why not spend a class period sewing a cute stuffed animal or a pair of boxing, boxer shorts instead of clowning around and breaking expensive sewing machines? Why would someone take another student's homework and ruin it? But then she grew bored with these questions and her mind drifted to larger concerns. She'd always been an avid letter writer, mostly to her local newspaper. She did not for the life of her understand why a student prayer group could not pray before assemblies and football games. She questioned teaching sex ed to middle schoolers. She thought that parents should take more responsibility for their own children instead of expecting the schools to feed them breakfast, lunch, and snack and teach them things that were once learned in church or at home. Soon she was no longer writing letters at all, but drafting everything she had to say about the wor world in lines and stanzas. Janine returned the folder to its place and locked the file cabinet. Her classroom had one measly window and she could see that the storm her daughter warned her about was churning the sky with dark gray clouds. Her students had spent the morning debating the possibility of school cancellation. Just a little bitty storm, one of them said dismissively. When she got home, there'd be more to do, taking down awnings and bird feeders, folding up the lawn chairs left out after her daughter's afternoon tanning sessions. It would be nearly six o'clock before she finished, no time to write or even sit down for a moment. She unlocked and opened her file cabinet again and rummaged, rummaged beneath the folders for a familiar crinkly package, a stale pack of menthols she was saving for a day such as this. She closed her fingers around the package, then let go. She had a stack of papers to grade and surely Rick was not taking a break at his job. He didn't believe in breaks and would work straight through a 12 hour sun hot day just to set an example for his crew. Everything in Rick's world was done according to a predictable schedule and for a purpose. He didn't believe in anything as wasteful as a smoke break. Janine imagined what the cigarette would taste like outside with the wind whipping and the air taking on a sudden sharpness. In the early years of their marriage, Janine had stayed home and even then she'd written stories for the girls, letters to her sister, then the editors of various North Florida newspapers. She'd never written poetry, not until this year, and she couldn't explain it well to anyone except Rick, who had been her truest confidant ever since they'd started dating way back in high school. I don't know how it happened, she told him. It's like I'm suddenly talking in a new language. She'd shyly handed the poems over one morning in bed and Rick had handled them reverently, then excused himself for his morning BM. After spending an entire hour with them in the bathroom, he confessed that he did not understand this new language she was speaking, but he believed whatever it was must be coming from God. He was like one of those biblical men who built boats and temples on command, the kind of man, strong and certain, that the world didn't make anymore. 
Janine sometimes felt an acute pain for her daughters, knowing they'd never find a man like their father. Why do you need to go somewhere place else to write? Rick had asked her early this morning when she showed him the application to the ranch, which she did not tell him she'd mailed two weeks ago. At the beginning of the summer, he'd built Janine a solarium, an octagonal room with glass walls and smooth white oak floors. He'd set her desk in the center of the room, facing out at the various staked finch feeders in their yard, and when Beth, their older daughter, had wanted to use the space for her elliptical trainer, Rick had told her no, her mother needed that room to write. It was hard to explain that the room itself, along with the application, seemed to be interfering with her writing, with the hand of God that once guided her poems. It was embarrassing to think about how one of her neighbors seeing her in the act of writing, though imagining some professor at the school reading the 12 short poems she'd enclosed with her application was not any easier. I want to be around other poets, Janine had tried to explain. Oh, he'd said, and she could tell that he was a little hurt. Perhaps if the room had not been glass, she thought now, because he had nothing to hide, Rick believed in absolute transparency. None of the bedroom doors in their house locked, and Rick and Janine had shared the same email account for more than 10 years. How could she explain that poems needed privacy, that it would have been better for her if he'd simply cleared out a closet? Janine checked her application folder one last time, then closed and relocked the drawer. It was likely she wouldn't get in anyway. What did she know about poetry? And who cared anymore about her subject, poor Terry Shivo, who'd starved to death years ago? Marianne turned over the manuscript in her lap, yet another end times piece, and thought of her sister Ruth, who'd once confessed to reading the first of the Left Behind books. Did you like it? Marianne had asked, trying not to let her alarm show. It was okay, Ruth said, and that way she once had about most everything. She could take it or leave it, her tone seemed to imply, but Marianne thought what she was really saying was that she wasn't sure what she was supposed to like. Marianne had been that way herself as a teenager, and for many years she'd seen the process of becoming an adult as about replacing that uncertainty with strong, unyielding opinions about music, about politics, about books, about art, in that way, she was not so different from her sister. Marianne did not believe in God and had suspected that he did not exist as soon as she noticed how much other people insisted on his existence. In high school, Ruth had become one of those people, attending a Baptist church three times a week and eventually dating and becoming engaged to the youth minister there. Their father, a community college professor who liked conflict on paper, but not in real life, insisted that it was a phase provoked by postponed grief. He'd rebuffed Marianne's offers to come home, to get involved, and she hadn't pushed it. You know how she is, he said. That's the problem with people like you. You don't believe in anything, Ruth later claimed, full of certainty when Marianne tried to talk her out of teenage marriage while their father despaired in his study. Not God, not God's love, not even love. Ruth was wrong to say that Marianne didn't believe in anything. She believed in things you could see or prove. She believed in science, believed in abortions, believed in the miracle of stem cells. She believed in population control and drug legalization, gun control and public transportation. She believed in generous arts grants and taxes for the rich. She thought everyone should be an organ donor and should have no say in the matter. She thought cats and dogs should be spayed and neutered, and that no one should have children before the age of 30. She believed in climate change and the electric car, in NPR and PBS, in free speech and online privacy and free lunch and Medicaid. She believed in gay marriage and no marriage. She had no business starting a school for people equally passionate about their own opposing opinions, people who clearly believed in God. Her father said as much when she told him she was moving to Florida to start an inspirational writing ranch for evangelical Christians. That doesn't sound like you, was actually what he said. But at least she was doing something, participating in this world instead of letting it run over her or leave her behind, bending it to her needs instead of the opposite. The storm was taking its time. 
It seemed that she'd been watching the sky's gradual darkening, the gathering clouds for hours now. Above the smoothness of sand worn down by surf, there was a stick, thick stratum of paper, black papery skinned mussels, each one broken up open and picked clean by a seabird. Oh, I'm happy as a clam, Marianne remembered telling Ruth once when her sister asked over the phone how she was doing. It was maybe a year after their mother died and every call from home was still a shock. It was her mother she wanted to tell about her classes, her friends, the problems of dorm life. Any other voice, even her baby sisters, left her with a hollow feeling in her stomach. Just how happy are clams anyway, Ruth had asked. In her youth and her earnestness, she'd been serious, though for a moment she'd sounded just like their mother, had brought her back to life, performed a miracle. Sometimes it made Marianne angry, not believing in God. That's the end of that chapter. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys. I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you have. Belle, do you, would you prefer them in the chat or on, in the video? Either way, whatever people are comfortable with. I know sometimes people, I was on a Zoom call earlier and my, and my audio kept cutting out. And so I typed my question in the chat. Either way. Bella? Hi. Hi. Glenn, <laughs> um, I'm just wondering in, what, in your background, do you have um, interest in religious themes? I know I do, so I was curious why that um, appeared. Well, I, I kind of have an interest as an outsider. I grew up in a, um, a very, in, in Virginia, in a really rural place where, you know, going to church was just a really, really big part of of everyone, just about everyone I knew, it was part of their their culture, and my family did not. And so the kind of conflict between um, those two cultures was interesting to me, and and was something that I wanted to explore in the book. And I think feeling like an outsider to that is also, um, you know. If you heard a little bit in Marianne, it's kind of also something that I think about too. How is it? What? How do you explore it in your work? What is the, the context? Um, well, my first um, middle grade book was about um, a Jewish Orthodox girl, growing up in, as an only child in a community, a modern Orthodox community that celebrated big families. Oh well, what is it called? Um, one is not a lonely number. Oh, I've heard, yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, Thank you. It was part of the Sydney Taylor um, program. So um, I wanted a book that um, wasn't about the Holocaust or Christmas envy. Um, so just a yeah. very, and I'm also interested in more deeper side, like um, which sounds like your novel might be going into where um, religious choices that parents make for kids um, in their young life, how it reverberates into their adult life and maybe even the next generation and possibly a little bit um, less positive ways. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, well, I'm going to get that be your book because um, we're always looking, my daughter is very interested in reading about, uh, she's just interested in reading and being read to about, you know, other cultures and other, um, you know, and it's hard to find good, interesting, um, not ex unexpected middle grade books sometimes. So fantastic. Um, hello, everyone. Sticking with the theme of religion, um, which Evelyn started. I wanted to ask, um, have you read any type of works with characters, especially protagonists, who have continued to stay grounded in their religious upbringing? And have you seen empathetic portrayals of people of faith 
in works and maybe you can remember examples. So for example, one, one great example I think of is Gilead. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, that's, right? that's, a great that's example. one of the best examples I've seen. And I was also going to ask, um, what advice would you have for, do you think that people of faith or religious people tend to be represented in unsympathetic and unempathetic ways in literature? And if so, why do you think that is? And how would you suggest that writers write, um, how, how can they write people of faith empathetically if that's their intention? Wow, those are, those are great questions. Um, I guess starting sort of backwards, um, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that if you're not prepared, for me as a writer, um, I'm interested in, in reading for the most part um, characters um, and writing characters in particular um, who are treated with empathy and who are um, um, people who even as you might question their choices or, um, or, or you know, the, even as they are deeply flawed, um, they are, are people that I, I want to be drawn to characters in, um, in my reading. And, um, and so I think that, you know, the first way is to think about how you are like this character. So my character, Janine, who I read about, who I read from in the first part of the scene, um, she's really different from me in a lot of ways in that she, um, uh, had children really young. I had my children older. She is in a very traditional, you know, marriage with, um, very traditional, you know, strong division of labor um, um, where she doesn't even like, a, you know, fill out her own mortgage pa paperwork. You know, that's not very much like me. She's a home ec teacher. Um, uh, and so, the, you know, and, she, and she's also very, very religious, which I am not. And, um, and yet um, she is like me in a lot of ways in that I, I am a teacher and have spent my, um, I, b before um, the teaching that I do now at um, North Carolina State University, I was a K-12 year teacher for many years. And um, I um, was, I'm, I often have K-12 teachers in some way in my writing because I'm just sort of interested in that world of education. She also suffers from a great deal of, of anxiety and I am a someone who suffers from anxiety and she has a lot of anxiety about um, harm coming to her children. And um, so, you know, instead of thinking as a writer, as, when I was approaching her character, instead of thinking about the ways that, you know, I saw her as um, different, I thought about how, um, you know, you know, I have been a person thinking about like detention slips sitting in um, in uh, my classroom at the end of the day and wondering about you know some application for something and and so those kinds of feelings and those kinds of thoughts um, helped draw me closer um, about um, characters um, you know being treated with um, with empathy in general or characters religious characters in um, in novels, it's it's often really hard for me to spend. Um, it's hard for me sometimes, even though like I have a you know great wall of books behind me and my house full of books. Like what what comes to mind often is um, is you know the the work that I've read most recently. And um, every summer I try to have uh, pick a different author with my mom, um, and we'll read as many books by that author as we can. Um, and um, this summer we were we were having Louise Erdrich summer. Am I, am I, and also to speak of middle grade novels, her um, Birch Bark House series is absolutely wonderful. Um, if you have any young people who want to read a um, um, about uh, 19th century Ojibwa life, it's like um, it's a series of four books, and they're absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, but I think that Erdrich um, often will show people um, characters, you know, who approach 
um, both Christianity and um, traditional Ojibwe faiths um, with like great empathy and respect. And I mean, obviously, and, um, and that just draw you closer to the characters and the characters themselves become um, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they still remain individuals, right? They're not defined um, by that, that one part of their lives. Um, the summer before that, um, a writer I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow, Miriam Taves. My mom and I read all the Miriam Taves books. And um, she is, uh, um, her family, she comes from a Mennonite family in Canada. And um, there's a great profile of her, which is how I learned how to pronounce her name in the New Yorker, um, like last year or something. And she often writes about, um, so Women Talking, which was her most recent book, um, is about um, a group of, you know, faithful women Mennonites who have also um, really suffered because of um, the patriarchy of um, the way that their community worked. And um, that I, th I think that book is really masterful in addressing very, very dark subject matters and um, the you know the, the 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 problem of patriarchy, while also being very respectful of um, of you know the people of faith in the same way that, as you said, um, uh, Robinson is in, in Gilead. But um, I think those are great questions, and um, it, you know definitely deserves more uh, more to to talk about. Um, um, thank you. Did I did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Tara asked in the in the um, chat um, that I said I started the book in 2011, but it was published last year, 2018. What was the writing process for this book, Struggles, etc.? What is the most difficult part of the writing process for you and how do you work through it? Um, that's a great question too. So I did start the book and um, got through a draft of it probably by, I don't know, 2013 or something like that, um, maybe even a little before. Um, no, 2013, and and had a contract for the book, but knew that I wanted to revise it. And I, at that time, had also started writing um, essays about my experience with infertility and the research that I was doing around fertility, um, infertility, and um, and reproduction, and um, and reproductive medicine. And so I, I was just kind of drawn away from writing fiction for a while. And I was, I was writing a lot of nonfiction. And so in the meantime, I did publish another book, um, The Art of Waiting in 2016. Um, but it was, so th that then meant that I went back to revising this book, which was really inspired in part by, in the part of Virginia where I'm from, um, uh, religious and Tea Party backlash to the Obama administration. Um, in 2010, 2011, um, I was revising this book in, you know, after Trump was elected. So that was really difficult. I mean, at the end, on the one hand, um, there was a lot of interest in um, for-profit education, which this is, book is in part about for-profit education. Um, but everything was, you know, quite horrible. And I know a lot of other writers really struggle with just like, how do we deal with you know, how unimaginably horrible and difficult things are right now. Um, and, um, and so I, I, for me, revision is often very, very difficult. Um, I have gotten to be better friends with revision after working on the revision of a novel that I'll read from next. And, um, uh, but generally, like, after writing and thinking, oh, yeah, it's done, then having to go back and really, like, you know, take something apart and put it back together um, is hard. And how I work through it is in some ways taking a lot of walks, being outside, um, taking breaks, trying to be away from, you know, the internet, you know, if I can, trying to be away from, um, you know, kind of the pressure of like email and connectivity with everything, not in the news, even though, you know, that's also part of, you know, responsibility to keep a, check on those things. If I can just take a few hours to, to work on something, if I'm revising, that helps a lot. 
And um, hmm, the next question by Evelyn is another good one. Based on your experience, do you recommend doing multi, multi writing projects rather than fo focusing on a singular book and getting it done sooner, hopefully? Uh, torn between finishing the new middle grade novel and also writing essays and entering competition. That's a really good question that I struggle with too. I don't think I have a better answer at all than you do, Evelyn, because I go back and forth where I am sometimes thinking, okay, I just want to work on one thing. Um, I want to finish this one thing. And then, um, but then I'll miss writing the other thing. And sometimes writing those essays helps you to understand something that you're working on that is, um, um, you know, your longer, the, the thing that you really, really want to finish sooner. I don't know if that helps. All right, can I, can I ask uh, yeah. the question that I have up there that it's so tiny that it's uh, a little bit lost, but. Um, oh, sorry, it's at the top. I'm so sorry. Oh, not at all. It's fine. Um, it's a question about text. It's about meaning and it's not about process. So it may not help other people much, but I'm really curious about just the, the 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 texture of storytelling so yeah to me, that room with the with the windows the glass windows somehow evoked that same sense of being scrutinized constantly that can lead to writing detention slips and um whether or not you meant that that way uh, the reason i kept thinking of it is to me writing about complex things like people with religious backgrounds whom we tend to see in our secular world so-called secular world now as kind of unfashionable or whatever you know just sort of a little twist -twist as we think about it uh, but they are some of the most interesting characters and related to that people with flaws people with dubious things about them people who are um, unsavory characters are sometimes the most uh, important and complicated characters to write about or talk about. And that to me also related back to like the school delinquency kind of, kind of element. So I don't know why, but I got really stuck on that. Like, do you, do you even see writing about things like this as a thing that requires a special kind of license or even a special kind of privacy, which, which may be your, your glass room was, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I don't that's, know. that's a great observation that no one has made before, but I think you're right. I mean, part of the book is about being blocked. Um, and I mean, it, there's like the financial um, hole that Marianne has gotten into. She has a great deal of student debt from her um, MFA program. Mm -hmm. And then she starts this program that's getting other people into debt. She has had a lot of trouble writing new work. She's in part blocked because she hasn't dealt with the grief over her mother. And, and Janine, who needs to be in a space that is, you know, um, with other people who are, if not like-minded, at least, you know, on some sort of artistic path that, um, that um, can give her some instruction or some other examples of how to even be on an art artistic path, right? Mm -hmm. She, um, yeah, when she goes to that room, she's, she's blocked too, and it is. And, I, and I, I've felt that way before too. I think a little less so since I've had children because time is just, like so precious that I just think, okay, time, I'll take it, whatever. I'll do it in a car. I'll write in a car, right. um, you know, which sometimes I do. I'll drive my car to the library, not to get like internet and, but just to have my computer out and just not have anybody bothering me. And I mean, you know, there's somebody here watching them and stuff, but, um, but you know, that, that, that kind of, that feeling of being in, I think, especially when I haven't had other pressures, you know, kind of, um, or when I've had fewer other pressures, um, uh, it has been, um, you know, paradoxical, paradoxically harder to write in some ways, like the emptier the room in some ways, um, the harder that it is. Um, somehow um would you all like for me uh, would you all like for me to read a few pages from um from the next thing that i'm working on now sure okay i'll do that um so but those are really good questions and um and i appreciate them and i also appreciate the observation so um 
So this, these, this is a few pages for just from the beginning. So you don't need a whole lot of setup because it's the beginning. This is a new novel that I've been working on and it's called To Build a Fire. And it is set in September uh, 2021, um, over six days. All right. Evelyn. The morning I learned about Helen Davenport's disappearance, I woke to a mysterious stillness. The power had gone out in the night and the absence of even the faint electrical hum from my appliances made the day feel like a holiday or a snow day. In fact, it was a September Thursday, and if I didn't hurry, I'd be late for my retrieval. I didn't know that Helen was missing, not yet, or how her disappearance would affect me. When I realized that the power was out, I thought in a panic that it was all for naught, the difficult to administer shots, the horrible expensive medication, the thousands of dollars cashed out of my retirement I'd forked over to the clinic in Raleigh. The phrase that actually blinked into my mind was all for NOT, which is how my high school students, nice kids, but not attentive readers, write the phrase. I studied for my AP English exam, but it was all for naught. I sat up in bed, checked my phone, then realized that I didn't need electricity to do what had to be done. Nothing import that important that would happen to me that day would happen at home, and it didn't matter if I skipped a shower or looked at myself with the light on. Who cared if my socks matched or my hair was combed, any of it. I lit the stove with a match, boiled water for co coffee, maybe the last caffeine I'd have for a long time. I dressed quickly and selected a fresh mask from the box on my bookshelf. I saw power trucks, power truck lights from the bottom of my driveway and thought, I was fast. One of my neighbors must have called in the outage, I thought. As a teacher, I'm usually up before my neighbors, potters and yoga teachers and retired people who sometimes barely even notice that the power is out or look smugly perplexed when I mention the inconvenience. Oh, the power was out? Lately, we'd had storms and rain and the high winds and sodden tree limbs meant a number of days starting like this one. No shower, stovetop coffee. By the time I got home, midday, things should be fixed. Just around the woodsy bend in the road toward the river, lights flashed reassuringly. I turned in the other direction toward the city. The nurse who found me taking off my shoes in the room with the gurney was surprised that I was alone. Or maybe she wasn't surprised, only disappointed, the same way a server might be upon realizing that you were going to occupy a two-top with your phone and your book, making the other diners uncomfortable and cutting into her tips. Oh, you're alone, is what she said. I've been to all my appointments alone. I thought alone was good, safer. I tried to respond with no edge to my voice. The nurse, who I liked well enough, but who was not my nurse, the one who emailed and called with my hormone levels, was pregnant. She explained about the twilight sedation, how it wasn't safe for me to drive. I told her that a friend would meet me after, and she left me with a gown, slippers, surgical mask, and a paper cap to cover my hair. When I was finished dressing, I should open the door a crack, and she'd return to insert my IV. You like to do those calisthenics, she remembered. I was a difficult stick, all the nurses like to say, but it seemed to help if I windmilled my arms first, or maybe the exertion made the difficult stick less painful. Probably what it was, a distraction, something to do in those moments, awkward because the nurse was unable to do her job, awkward because of the reasons I was there, to have my eggs removed, then injected by an embryologist with a stranger's sperm, selected from a database after long consideration. I'd gotten four vials and had gone through the first three in fruitless attempts at artificial insemination. I disrobed, covered myself with the gown. I cracked the door, commenced the exercises, felt my arms getting warm, then my neck, my face. I kept my exposed backside to the wall, but caught a glimpse of my head in the reflective surface of a stainless steel cabinet. It was still a shock. My once long, dyed dark hair shorn two inches from the scalp I'd done it at home with electric clippers when I made plans for IVF. Part of it, more than I expected, was growing in white, and without makeup or any attempt to style it, I looked like a little boy, an old, tired little boy. A pixie cut, my friend Kate said encouragingly. 
Rosemary's baby, said her daughter Winifred. Not me at Pharaoh, she clarified when she saw my pleased expression. The baby. A fresh start. That's what I'd thought. No risky trips to the salon or last minute root touch ups with whatever toxic formula was on sale. I would not have time for that in my new life. I put on the cap, the mask. Ready? The nurse asked when the needle was prepared. It took five sticks, four painful, frustrated, apologetic jabs inside my elbow until finally she found a vein on top of my hand. It was where they stuck old people, I thought woozily, where they'd stuck my mother in the end. There, she said, applying the tape, a note of unearned triumph in her voice. I thought of my students, finally passing a test I let them retake and retake, not their triumph, mine. I came to after the procedure in the same room where I'd undressed, across the room where my tennis shoes, my mismatched socks, my gray black yoga clothes. An idea to consider, the doctor was saying. She was sitting in a chair by the door, holding a clipboard. Because we got so many eggs, is maybe you'd like to free some. How many? I was flat on my back, and my voice sounded distant, disembodied. My breath felt hot and stale inside the mask. She looked at the clipboard. Eighteen. Sixteen were mature, which is really very good, considering. And you didn't have signs of hyperstimulation, so we can proceed with the transfer of this cycle. Very good news. I closed my eyes, trying to picture the 16 mature eggs, more eggs than my body would ovulate naturally in a year, all from this one cycle, these two weeks of self-administered injections and solo appointments. She continued, some patients like to split their cycles, freezing half the eggs and inseminating half. That way, if you meet someone, I sat up, pulling the blanket around me. Wait, I said, wait, I assume I have to decide this now? Well, yes, she said, looking again at her clipboard, as if she might have missed something there. Maybe the part about what happened when you surprised someone in a hospital gown with a potentially life-altering decision? You would have to decide now while the embryologists are prepping, but the expense would be much the same. And if you did meet someone, you'd have your 38-year-old eggs, which could be inseminated and transferred years from now. I thought of that last vial of sperm. Hadn't it been unfrozen already? Would there be some left to refreeze? I wished I could get my clothes and begin putting them on in a dignified way, but I still felt dizzy. Who said that I want to meet someone, I asked. I have met plenty of people and I took a long time finding and choosing my donor. Did you know that he's a doctor and a poet who went to Harvard and then did two Peace Corps twice? I mean, he did both things twice, Harvard, Harvard, then two Peace Corps. Do you really think I have a chance of finding someone better than that around here currently? It was an exaggeration. He only did the one Peace Corps in Uganda, but it sounded better, more extreme. The doctor in the room didn't answer, so I continued. Do you want to see what happened when I told my ex that I was going through with this? Would you like to see what he wrote back to me? The doctor did not want to see the text exchange, of course, and it would have taken me an unsatisfyingly long time to find it anyway. Though I would have, I would have scrolled and scrolled just to prove to her that my choices were sound, backed by damning evidence of the contemptibility of real life men. I took as deep a breath as the mask allowed and flung the blanket off my legs. I stood, stalked across the room to my clothes. I would like to stick to the original plan. You're in love with him, my sister Vera accused months ago when I began telling her about the donor. I didn't know his name. That wasn't in the downloadable file, but I knew about him. His, fi his height, 5'10", which felt perfect, maybe even a little aspirational for someone like me, only 5'2". He had never smoked, and no one in three generations of his family had died from cancer or suicide. He hoped one day to travel to all seven continents and had a good start, he felt, with four. He loved astronomy and had lived for a time while in residency at USC near Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. He liked to run to the observatory and see the stars. He was a runner. Why would he sell his sperm if he's a doctor? He can't need the money. Vera lived in DC and worked for an environmental nonprofit. She donated a quarter of her salary to Greenpeace and collected all her non-recyclable trash in mason jars, which she labeled by the year and kept like moldering time capsules under the sink. 
I only saw her if I could get up the nerve to make the drive myself. Even before the shutdowns, she'd stopped all non-essential travel. Her whole life since our mother died of cancer had been about carbon neutralizing. I hadn't mentioned the doctor's, the donor's continent hopping plans. He obviously wants to help people, I told her, lesbians, heterosexuals with sperm issues, single women who would like to raise a child unencumbered by a man. See, that's really what you're in love with, she said, the romance of doing this alone, but it'll be harder than you think. This was closer to the truth, the romance I had in mind, and also the difficulty I did not. When things began to fall apart with X, this is what I called him in my exchanges with Vera, with Kate, even with Winifred, a fantasy had started, or rather a series of fantasies of what life as a single mother would be like. Sometimes I imagined an older child, someone I'd adopted and could accompany to school performances, parent-teacher nights, soccer games. Other times I saw myself with an infant snuggled against my chest or sleeping peacefully in a bassinet. When I'd gotten my schedule for the retrieval and transfer, I'd made a series of hopeful wellness investments, a float tank appointment, a yoga subscription, a farm share, I bought all natural bug spray, which seemed to attract bugs, and started cleaning my house with vinegar and lemon juice. I was preparing to leave my old life behind, a little like cutting my own hair. It felt good and also terrifying. That was what X had texted back to me when I sent a photo of my meds lined up on the counter in my little kitchen, the one he sometimes shared. Finally taking the plunge I'd written, and he'd responded with a symbol of alarm, surprise, fear, perhaps disappointment that I was taking the step, the one we'd broken up over. It was something he could have sent to anyone about anything. I waited for him to write something else, but that was our last exchange. We'd met at the vintage furniture store he owned, a charming place with red brick walls and big old windows and heaps of teak furniture. Once he held a show of my paintings and I sold five pieces. He liked my friends and they liked him back. He was a good kisser, an able cook, funny, but we'd each miscalculated what the other person wanted out of a relationship, out of life. He was in his mid forties and had never married or had kids. I'd taken this as a positive sign, thinking it meant he was not a quitter. I was in my mid thirties when we met, also never married, no kids. He read my status as good for him, meaning I liked things how they were. Don't you like waking up late, not being poor, spending your weekends however you want? Don't we have it pretty good already? Why complicate your life? This was, of course, before. Before my mother died, before the pandemic, before the disappearance of Helen Davenport. He had no idea how complicated things could get. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions about that one too, if you want. Yeah, I'm really curious why you decided to incorporate the pandemic like so soon. You know, I I guess I the the that's a really good question. I um I drafted the book. I had a draft of it like right before the a first draft right before the pandemic started, and then I started reading a lot about um uh well, n people who were, you know, trying to have babies in, you know, difficult circumstances in hospitals, but also people who were going through um, different kinds of um, different or non-traditional family building practices like, you know, surrogacy or IVF and, um, you know, other kinds of assisted reproduction and how, and how difficult the, the pandemic um, made them. And the book takes place over the six days between an egg retrieval and transfer and also involves this this uh, this neighbor's disappearance and um and also climate change and i guess i thought that that was just it i i you know spent a lot of time imagining the world of this book which very much takes place in um my own um community like where i live the the house that i imagine um evelyn the protagonist living in is, is very much my house. The difference is that she is alone 
And also um, the other thing about the book is that it has no men in any scene. It's a lot like the movie, The Women. Um, uh, there are just no men in any scene. And I, that was sort of, the, happened sort of the same way where I started writing it and I just was like, huh, there are any men in this book? Oh, I think I'm gonna keep going with that. I, every, every person who appears, you know, there are references to men, but, and they affect the book, but there's no, they're never in scene. Wow. Well, I have a question. Um, yeah. Your, your, the first, the novel seems like it's close third person and this new one is in first person. And I was wondering if, how conscious your choice was of switching that, that point of view and having that close interiority with the- Yeah, first. that's a really, that is a really good question. And I was thinking about that when I was working on the presentation because I actually wound up choosing to talk, I have some close third, um, but most, a lot of what I, uh, the pieces that I've selected to talk about are first person. And I, you know, I, I, I really like writing in third person. I think you can get very, very close to a character, but somehow this book just sort of started coming to me in, in first person. And then the challenge became, and that was part of what I did in my, I've worked on in my revision. There's another important character who's a teenager and she's very important to the book. Um, but she didn't have any, you know, she didn't have her own chapters. And I thought, well, like, how can I, I, you know, I, it wouldn't make sense. I didn't like, you know, changing from first person to then a third describing her. It just didn't, I didn't feel like there was a very elegant solution, but I came up with the idea of, of representing her voice through, um, through her homework that she has to, you know, turn in or communications with her teachers that she has to turn in in like pandemic, you know, pandemic world. <laughs> and, um, and so, and, it's, and so that's another first person. And so, yeah, it's kind of a challenge to write. You have to have the voice, but I suppose Evelyn, the character is enough like me um, that, you know, I sort of tried to channel that. Yeah, I, I love um, the excerpt that you shared it has such a sense of humor and an inter and, um, that the interiority is so, uh, the thought, the way that her thoughts work um, is so, is well crafted. So. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, it's my first time reading from it. So thanks for listening, you all, because I thought, oh, yeah, I should try to read something new because that's what you do at, a, at an art center when you're in <laughs> residency. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any burning, last burning questions um, for, for Belle tonight? It looks like... Manisha? Manisha? Yeah. Thank you so much for such a wonderful reading. I love the second, uh, the, the novel in progress that you read from. Thank uh, you. Extremely intense and I was in that world completely. Uh, but two things kept coming back to me which have like little to do with the reading. But I, I just thought I should say that. So uh, the first time I saw you was in 2010 at Breadloaf and I- Oh, wow. It, it was just, it just felt really good. And uh, the second thing, like, you know, uh, in your first reading too, you kept like after, during the discussion, you kept mentioning like how you really want to be in a space uh, where like with zero distractions and that made me feel like, you know, I need to go back to VSC right now in that room where like I've never been pampered so much as I was over there. And the only thing you wanted to do was write with like, little sleep and it did not really bother so i totally empathized with that uh, emotion of yours like heading to the library or like you know even when, when i came back from vsc after a month i was speaking very softly and i was like why are these people here <laughs> That sounds, yeah, that sounds so wonderful. The, um, yeah, the, well, the food that you don't have to think about making where there's like food made for you and then, but then having the connections of other artists, um, it all, I mean, I'm determined to get there um, when, when, when it's safe again, it does. And, and these places are so important. We have a, and, and, I, and I appreciate too, how much um, VSC also has worked to give scholarships and uh, and fellowships. Um, a friend and former student of mine had um, a, 
35 under 35 or something like that fellowship last year. And it was just, it was just profoundly important to her to be able to go and spend a month. You know, it was a whole month, which is awesome. And I wish I had also done more of that kind of thing too um, when I was younger. Um, we have a place in, in North Carolina called Weymouth um, um, Arts Center, and it's really fantastic. It's in Southern Pine, so it's not too far from my house. So it's, um, and it's this big old mansion and everyone I know, um, and they're starting, they're, I think they're starting up again soon, and they're, but they're only gonna let one person in at a time. And it's like one person can stay there, you know, for a week at a time. So you'll be staying in a big old mansion by yourself. And everyone I know thinks that Weymouth is, um, Calvin, I don't know if you've heard this, but everyone I know thinks that it's haunted. And they'll tell me, oh no, there's a ghost in this particular room. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, I don't believe in that. So I was like, no, there's not. But I still don't think I would probably stay there totally by myself. So I don't know. I think they should be able to allow two people. Anyway. Uh, it was uh, it was 31st October that I reached Vermont and my residency was like all through November so it and it just like struck me that this is October the end of October going on so just too many too many past memories yeah it's so nice to yeah, see it you was really nice to reconnect thank you so much that was wonderful Thank you very much. Yeah, I really appreciate being able to see you all. And I hope that you'll come to the little talk tomorrow. I worked hard on putting together a Google slide presentation, which I don't usually, <laughs> but I think, you know, I got to learn how to do these things. I'm not going to be in front of people like in, you know, real life. So. Um, so yeah, I do want to drop in a couple, if there are any last um, questions. I'm gonna share a couple of links. Uh, oops, sorry. Oh, someone asked if I have a website. I do. I think it is yeah. belldogs.com. Um, I used to have a blog and I really miss those days, but. Um, <laughs> That's one of the I, links I'm gonna drop into the, the chat. Cool. Go ahead, Bell. sorry, I didn't know. Oh, I was just saying that I kind of miss, I like, I like a blog more than in some ways like social media because in social, you know, blog it's sort of like, you know, you can come here if you want, come on over if you feel like it. But in social media, it's like here, like I, it almost feels like you're interrupting or something. So I miss those days, but I took it down. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, I think my website should be up. If it's not, I'll put it back up again, or I'll ask Richard to put it back up again. No, oh, blog. <laughs> your website is up and um, it has a, so many, a lot of links to um, your nonfiction that's published. Uh, in particular, I really enjoyed the piece in the Atlantic about Michelle Obama's um, infertility and her choices, and also how you interviewed your coworker um, or a colleague at NC State yes. um, and her perspective on the choices that Michelle um, made during uh, her husband's presidency as and during her time as first lady. It's a really interesting. Um, article so I recommend or essay I recommend um, for further reading <laughs> yeah thank you very much yeah Renisha Brow Browdy from um, professor at NC State is awesome um, and thanks so much Bill and um, you, for your generous time and for reading those two excerpts um, if you don't mind taking a minute to unmute and give our lovely generous reader a round of applause <laughs> Thank you all. It's really nice to see you. I hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for being here.